Let's read through Isaiah 56 so we can get the whole context of, of this. Remember, remember, the end of Isaiah here is always, Isaiah is always leading towards talking about the millennial kingdom, which hasn't yet happened. The thousand year reign of the promised one, the Messiah, the Messiah whose name is Jesus. Okay, so, so he had first talked about the deliverer Cyrus because he was delivering the Israelites from um, Babylon, the exile in Babylon, and now he's talking about the predictive uh, future, right? The prophecy of the Messiah, and he is the deliverer. He is the deliverer. So, and he's always, always coming back to repentance. Repentance, because his people, right? His people, Judah, Israel, Jerusalem, his people were worshiping idols. They were, they were turning from him, and he continued through judgment because he loves us. Remember, that's God's loving action against sin is judgment. You know that, right? He just keeps calling you back, calling you back, calling you back. He loves you so much. He's like, look, look, that's the eternal thumb pressure. Look, I love you, love you, love you, love you, love you. Look up, look up, look at me, look at me. And so he's continually asking his people, including us, to repent, to return to him, to return to him, to turn around, to turn around, to forsake your own way and run after him. Okay, so in uh, chapter 56, what he's talking about here is... <laughs> I get a bang out of this. Even though they weren't following, even though the Jewish people weren't following hard after Yahweh God at all, right? They were following idols and doing whatever they wanted. They, they didn't want salvation for anybody else but them. <laughs> Is that great? Does that sound like us? Does that, yeah, yeah, like Jonah, absolutely like Jonah, right? Uh, wait a minute. You know, I, mean, I love how God's like, you care more about the stinking fig tree than you do about the people that are dying in Nineveh. It was doing a, mm, got hot here, you know, hello. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I mean, but that's so true, isn't it? It's like, well, you know, we're not falling hard after you at all, but hey, it's not for anybody else. This is just exclusive, okay? So we're gonna see what the Lord says about that. So let's read 56. This is what the Lord says, Yahweh God, L-O-R-D, maintain justice and do what is right. For my salvation is close at hand, and my righteousness will soon be revealed. Blessed is the man who does this, the man who holds it fast, who keeps his Sabbath without desecrating it, and keeps his hand from doing any evil. Let no foreigner who has bound himself to the Lord say, The Lord will surely exclude me from his people. And let not any eunuch complain, I am only a dry tree. For this is what the Lord says, To the eunuchs who keep my Sabbaths, who choose what pleases me and hold fast to my covenant, to them I will give within my temple and its walls a memorial and a name better than sons and daughters. I will give them an everlasting name that will not be cut off. And foreigners who bind themselves to the Lord to serve him, to love the name of the Lord, and to worship him, all who keep the Sabbath without desecrating it, and who hold fast to my covenant. These I will bring to my holy mountain and give them joy in my house of prayer. Their burnt offerings and sacrifices will be accepted on my altar. For my house will be called a house of prayer for all nations. The sovereign Lord declares, He who gathers the exiles of Israel, I will gather still others to them besides those already gathered. Come, all you beasts of the field. Come and devour, all you beasts of the forest. Israel's watchmen are blind. They all lack knowledge. They are all mute dogs. They cannot bark. They lie around and dream. They love to sleep. They are dogs with mighty appetites. They never have enough. They are shepherds who lack understanding. They all turn to their own way. Each seeks his own gain. Come, each one cries, let me get wine. Let us drink our fill of beer. And tomorrow will be like today, or even far better. That beer thing, they must be Wisconsinites, huh? Yeah. <laughs> I'm like, I'm like, is that in the New King James Version? It says no intoxicating drink. I'm like, who wrote the NIV? Right? The beer of it. All right, so <clears throat> all right, so. I call this a house of prayer for all nations, okay? For all nations. That's what Yahweh God is saying, right? This is for all nations. And so what's happening is, is this prophetic word is directed from the Lord to his discouraged people. Okay, they're discouraged, okay? Because why? Because they have slacked in obedience. They have slacked in righteousness. Funny how that happens. Funny, right? Same with us. 
When you slack in your obedience, when you slack in your righteousness, doing the next right thing, right, what happens? You get discouraged. You get discouraged, and he's, he's talking to them, okay? You know why? They see that there's absolutely no reason to repent as long as they're down. They, there's absolutely no reason to repent as long as they're down, okay? And so God is, is shaking them once again. He's shaking them out of this thinking, okay? And he's calling them to, look, keep justice. Do righteousness. This is what you're supposed to do. Do the next right thing, okay? In anticipation of what I will do. This is what you should be doing, looking forward to what I will do. I'm the deliverer. I will always deliver you. It's like saying, it's like a person saying this, um, Lord, you know what? I will start giving when you bless my finances. You ever done that? <laughs> I'll start giving when you bless my finances. Okay, that's what basically they're saying. Okay, and, and, and he says, no, you need to say no. You need to start, start and do it now in the anticipation that God has this. He's the provider. He's the one who will bless your finances, okay? He's the provider, okay? And so, and so uh, even though he wasn't talking about finances in this, it's that kind of a, a feeling. It's like, no, if, if you know, I, I'll do this when I see you doing this. And the Lord's like, no, you do this, then I do this, right? And don't you love, it's always, it's always a sweet if then. You know, if, if you do this, then I do this. It's not like he just says, look, do this. He says, no, you do this, and then there's a blessing. Isn't that so great? That's so great. Isn't that how you wooed your children? Look, if you do this, then this, right? Right, same kind of thing, same kind of thing. So uh, he says, look at, blessed is the man who does this. So you're blessed if you do this, okay? So there's both an inherent blessing in obedience. You know that, right? There's inherent blessing in obedience. And there's the old covenant blessing to obedience. Okay, because remember, in the old covenant, Right, what happened, right? Sacrificial, animals, grains, oils needed to be used, all different things to show the Lord that you're being obedient, that you're being obedient, that you trust him, that you know him. And then he'd say, that's right, you're declared righteous, you're declared righteous, you're declared righteous, you're declared righteous, because you're following hard after him, because you're obeying him. Even in the New Testament, it says what? It shows how much you love me if you what? If you keep my commandments, right? If you keep my commandments, if you obey me, okay? So in verses 3 through 8, we see this promise now for um, the foreigner. The foreigner are the nations outside of Israel, meaning the Gentiles. The Gentiles, okay? So the Gentiles, okay, and, and the outcast. And so he goes on to say, do not let the son of the foreigner who has joined himself to the Lord speak, saying, the Lord has utterly separated me from his people. Why shouldn't, why shouldn't they say that? Because it isn't true. Because it isn't true. Have you ever had anybody say something to you and you're like, that's not true, that's not true. I remember my kids would say, I'm like, what you're saying to me right now isn't true. And they would continue, I'm like, that's not true. And so he was saying, look, this isn't true. This isn't true. You may feel utterly separated. You may feel feel detached as a foreigner, okay? But God promises that you are not. So don't say that. Don't say that. You stand on my promise. You don't say this. You may feel that way, but that's not the truth, right? That's what you need to do. That's beguilement. That's how the accuser works. He goes, hmm, a little bit of, little bit of feeling, right? Mm -mm 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 -mm. Right? And then you have to say, that's not true. That's not true. The word of God says this. His promise says this. I'm standing on this. Over and over and over again. Be careful with your feelings because they will trip you up every time. Every time. You have to go to his word. You have to go to his word. You have to go ahead and say, nope, nope, you know what? You're an idiot. Right? Not to the people. I'm talking to Satan here, okay? You know, you're an idiot. You are trying to trip me up because God's word says this, and this is what I'm standing on. And that's what Isaiah is saying. It's not true. You're not foreigners. He doesn't see you as foreigners. You may feel like that, but you're not. You're absolutely a part of this. See, God didn't want them to accept their feelings of being cast out. Of being cast out. Though they may feel that way, God's word is always higher. Always higher. 
God's word is always higher. Remember, his ways are higher, his thoughts are higher, right? Always, always higher. And especially higher than your feelings. God's word is always higher than your feelings, okay? So when you, when you feel like outcast or you feel like a foreigner or you feel like you don't belong, okay, that can become a self-fulfilling prophecy when you keep telling yourself that. And he says, stop that. He said, stop that. That is not truth, okay? It's in, it's in only refusing to not embrace those feelings, okay, and, and choosing then to trust God's promise. That's why you've got to be in the Word, right? That's why you need to have your non-negotiable face-to-face time so you know His Word, you know His promises, because those are true for you. They're true for me, just like they were true in Isaiah's day. And so you go back to it over and over again, okay? And so... When you choose to trust his promises, then those feelings can be broken. Then those feelings can be broken, okay? So if God says, Jill, you belong, you belong. Done deal. God said it, I believe it, that settles it. Done deal. You belong. You're not a foreigner. You're not an outcast. People may treat you like that, but guess what? Not true. You belong. You belong. So he mentions the eunuchs, okay? He says... Um, to the eunuchs who keep my Sabbath, okay? So this is the one he uses as an example who feels like an outcast, okay? He says, look it, I just want you to walk uprightly. I just want you to do the next right thing. I just want you to live in obedience, okay? Um, you may feel like an outcast, but I'm going to honor you. I'm going to bless you because that's who, because of just who you are, okay? And I will give you a place and a name in my house, he says. Wow, right? He's going to give a place and a name in my house, okay? So quite frankly, as I was studying this, I thought, you know, for many of us, that's not good enough. That recognition isn't good enough to have a place and a name in God's house. We want a place and a name now. We want a place and a name among mankind. We want a place and a name now, okay? Because it seems like life is easier, life is more pleasant when you have a place and a name now. Meanwhile, God says, but you do have a place and a name now. You know, you're written in Lamb's Book of Life, right? I've given you a place and name right now, okay? And so you need to have contentment having a place and a name in my house. Remember Paul said, I've learned to be what? Content. In what? All things. In all things. I've learned to be content in all things. Whether in little, whether in lot, whether, remember? I mean, he was all over. He's learned to be content. He's learned to be content. And so we need to be content with having our place and our name only with God. You guys, it's forever. It's forever. That's a good, good thing. The place and name we find with God is so much better than you'll ever find with men, okay? It, he says it's better than that of sons and daughters. It's an everlasting name that shall not be cut off. That shall not be cut off forever and ever and ever, okay? Now, he says even then, even, excuse me, even them, meaning the foreigners, meaning the Gentiles, okay, even them I will bring to my holy mountain and make them joyful in my house of prayer. Okay, so <clears throat> what has happened is, as I mentioned at the beginning, is that God's people, the Israelites, okay, they have gotten to the point where they think, look, we're going to be accepted by God no matter what. Right, so we're just going to live any way we want to, but we're accepted by God because you know what, we're God's people. I mean, we're the chosen. Right? That's what they're saying. And so, and so, meanwhile, we'll be accepted by God no matter what. But you, you Gentiles, you'll be rejected by God no matter what. And that's how they lived. That's how they lived, okay? And so the Lord makes it very, very clear that a foreigner, a Gentile, a eunuch, an outcast, okay, can follow hard after God and come to him in obedience. Now, you guys know what a eunuch is, right? It's a castrated man, right? Um, and so he's impotent. He's impotent. And he wasn't able to follow, um, do all the temple rituals. That's how you'd come and you'd worship. He'd have to be in the outer court, which is where the Gentiles were only able to be. Are you following? So you've got the Gentiles only in the outer, like actually it wasn't even a court. Well, it was an outside court. It was an outside court. So it was in the outside court. And then, and then the outcasts were there as well. 
So he's throwing the Gentiles and the outcasts together there, okay? And so he says, no, 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 I am going to what? I am going to make my house, and it's a house of prayer for all nations. It's a house of prayer for all nations. That's what my house is, okay? And so God wanted his temple, his house at that time, to not only be a place where Jewish people would worship him, but what? It's a house of prayer for all nations, it's not just for you Jews, right? It's for all nations, all right? And so the violation of this principle in the New Testament, right, made Jesus angry. Remember this? Remember he got, remember he, he was angry, but he did not sin. Remember this, okay? When you get angry, you have a very strong possibility of sinning. You do know that, right? <laughs> Jesus never did, okay? Jesus was angry, but he did not sin, okay? And so what happened is, is when he came to the temple and he found the outer courts filled with what? money changers, they had all the different animals that they were selling for sacrifice, you know, they were doing all this, you know, um, flea market kind of stuff, right? And they were using um, merchants and money changers and he walks in and he turns over the tables. He's like, my house is going to be a house of prayer. That's not what it's going to be. That's in Matthew 21, uh, 13. So he gathers the outcasts. The Lord gathers the outcasts, okay, and he says, Yet I will gather him to others, to others, okay? So because of the pain, because of the exile that, that Israel had, be, had gone through and will go through, they had become intensely self-focused. Isn't that what happens? If you're not very careful with yourself, right? If, if, if you're going through pain, if you're going through exile, if you're feeling outcast, this is you become self-focused. How does this affect me? How does this affect me? And that's what they had become, very self-focused, okay? And they believed that God only cared for them and not the rest of the nations, all right? And so, and remember, the rest of the nations had treated Israel pretty cruelly because remember, God used them in judgment, right, with invasions. And so they had treated Israel pretty cruelly. And so they were thinking, you know, uh-uh, this isn't for them, okay? But God wanted to expand the vision of Israel beyond their own borders so they would know that God absolutely loves the perishing world. Like we know in John 3.16 now, right? For God so loved the world that he gave his son. He wanted to know then, I love the perishing world. I just don't love you. I love everyone. I love everyone, okay? And I want you, O oh Israelites, to love them also. I want you to love them as I love them, okay? So in verse 9 then, I love how he just like inserts verse here. It's a promise to judge the blind leaders of God's people, of Israel. And it's, it's, it's a word to the beasts of the field. It says, all you beasts of the field come to devour, all you beasts in the forest, okay? So... The Lord God invites, he's inviting the beasts of the field to a great feast, to a great supper, okay, to eat up the corpses of the enemies after they lay on, on the land of, after the battle, which is the same picture that he uses in Revelation 19, verse 17, which says, then I saw an angel standing in the sun, and he cried with a loud voice, saying to all the birds that fly in the midst of heaven, Come and gather together for the supper of our great God, that you may eat the flesh of kings, the flesh of captains, the flesh of mighty men, the flesh of horses, and those who sit on them, and the flesh of all people, free and slave, both small and great. So he's talking about, right, the second coming of Christ of Jesus Christ, right? When there'll be the battle of Armageddon, he'll come on his great white horse, there'll be the sword, which is just his mouth, he'll come forward, we'll be with him, right? We'll all be riding white horses. Well, I'm not so sure if mine's white, but his is white, I know for sure. I don't think in the word of God it says that we're all white horses. I bet they are, don't you think? I mean, all I know is our horse is black and white, so she doesn't get to be there. So, so um, but we'll all be there, and what happens is the, the battle will be done before it's started. It'll just be done before it started. And then, and then this is what happens. This is um, all the beasts of the field and the birds are asked to come and devour what's left over, what's left over. He's making that same kind of reference to the promise to judge the blind leaders 
of God's people. Okay? And he goes on to talk to them how unfaithful they have been, how unfaithful they've been in 10 and 11. And he says, look, you guys are blind. You're supposed to know me. You're supposed to follow hard after me, and you're blind. And judgment is on the way. And I'm warning you. And you need to warn my people. You need to warn them, OK? And, and he says, look, you don't fulfill your purpose as a watchman on the wall. How good is a blind watchman? Right? It's a walled city. Jerusalem is a walled city. You're supposed to be a watchman on the wall. You're supposed to give them warning when there's invasions coming, when there's enemies coming, when something's happening, right? And he's like, look, a judgment is on the way, and you guys are blind. You're blind watchmen. You, you, you don't fulfill your purpose. You're, he says, you're ignorant. You're like dumb dogs simply sleeping. That's what he references them to. He says, you're like shepherds that cannot understand. So these ungodly leaders are a sad contrast to last week's lesson we learned about David, right? And what an amazing leader he was. Right? What, what did he have? He was called a man after God's own heart. Right? He was a leader, he was a commander, but he was a shepherd. What a, what a contrast between King David in Isaiah 55 and now supposedly these godly leaders that are supposed to be watchmen on the wall, and they are not. He says, you're unfaithful shepherds. You're unfaithful shepherds who only look to yourself for your own gain. I mean, think about it. You know, shepherds are supposed to what? Take care of the sheep, right? And they're only looking to take care of themselves. And that's what he says they're doing. And so he says, look, at the last, it's, it, it is verse 12. It's, it's, come, come, one says. These are the unfaithful leaders. Come, I'll bring wine, and we will fill ourselves with intoxicating drink. Tomorrow will be as today, and much more abundant. And so worse than being passively ignorant and blind, they are actively wicked. They are actively wicked. And as judgment approaches, what do they do? They simply drink and get drunk. As judgment approaches. That's what they do. And he says, tomorrow will be as today, but much more abundant. And so these, these, their, their blind faith, their blind faith in progress has replaced a reasonable faith, a reasonable faith in God. That's what they've done. They've replaced it. They've replaced it. And they are ripe for judgment. But they're unprepared for judgment. They're ripe for judgment, but they're unprepared for judgment. Right, so now let's continue in 57 because the story just continues. All right, because now he talks about the spiritual adultery of God's people here. All right, so let's, uh, let's just read through um, 13 of Isaiah 57. The righteous perish and no one ponders it in his heart. Devout men are taken away and no one understands that the righteous are taken away to be spared from evil. Those who walk uprightly enter into peace. They find rest as they lie in death. But you, come here, you sons of a sorceress, you offspring of adulterers and prostitutes. Whom are you mocking? At whom do you sneer and stick out your tongue? Are you not a brood of rebels, the offspring of liars? You burn with lust among the oaks and under every spreading tree. You sacrifice your children in the ravines and under the overhanging crags. The idols among the smooth stones of the ravines are your portion. They, they are your lot. Yes, to them you have poured out drink offerings and offered grain offerings. In the light of these things, should I relent? You have made your bed on a high and lofty hill. There you went up to offer your sacrifices. Behind your doors and your doorposts, you have put your pagan symbols. Forsaking me, you uncovered your bed, you climbed into it and opened it wide. You made a pact with those whose beds you love, and you looked on their nakedness. You went to Molech. Molech is a Canaanite idol. You went to Molech with olive oil and increased your perfumes. You sent your ambassadors far away. You descended to the grave itself. You were wearied by all your ways, but you would not say it is hopeless. You found renewal of your strength, and so you did not faint. Whom have you dreaded and feared that you have been false to me and have neither remembered me nor pondered this in your hearts? Is it not because I have long been silent that you do not fear me? I will expose your righteousness and your works, and they will not benefit you. When you cry out for help, let your collection of idols save you. The wind will carry all of them off. A mere breath will blow them away. But the man who makes his refuge will inherit the land and possess my holy mountain. Whoa. 
So are you following what's happening here? He's talking about Judah's idolatry, okay, and, and how it's like spiritual <laughs> adultery. Their idolatry, putting anything before God, right, okay, is like spiritual uh, adultery. And so he's saying there's been persecution of the righteous. In verses 1 and 2, he's like, he's like look at uh, he's carrying on, uh, Isaiah's carrying on with the rebuke of, the Ju of Judah's leaders from the previous chapter. And now the Lord, the Lord is speaking to the persecution of the righteous. And in this case, he's talking about the persecution has been neglect. You've neglected them. You've absolutely neglected them. So, so what happens is, he says, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to take away the righteous, he says. I'm going to take away the righteous from evil, and they're going to enter into peace. So, Though the righteous were ignored, though the righteous were persecuted by wicked leaders of Judah, God already had it done in the heavenlies. He's not going to forsake them. He's not going to forsake them. He wouldn't, okay? And so when they perished, when they perished, merciful men were taken away. That's what he says. Merciful men were taken away. That means that they perished, okay? And so what happened is, is God blessed the righteous, in taking them to peace with him forever. He lifted them out. He lifted them out. He lifted them out. He lifted them out, okay? And they were allowed to go away from evil, and they were allowed to come into peace forever with him. So he talks in verses 3 through 10 now to the, the spiritual adultery of leaders, okay, of God's people, and he really, he says, oh, look, come here. Let's talk about this, okay? He says, whom do you ridicule? Whom do you ridicule? And he says, look at the wicked among you have been making fun of my people, my real people, the ones who love me, my righteous people, the one who know me, the ones who know me, the one who are doing the next, doing the next right thing, okay? They mocked them. And God heard it. God cannot be mocked. Right? They were all mocking the righteous. And God heard it. And God cannot be mocked. And so the Lord challenges them and says, Who do you think you are? Who do you think you are? Who are you mocking? You're mocking me. You're mocking me, okay? He says, Are you not children of transgression, meaning of a sin, okay? Offspring of falsehood? No. Isn't that a common sin to human nature? Isn't that a common sin to human nature? What we do is we see the sins and problems of everybody else's and not our own. Right? We talked about that before, right? We got the great big, you know, huge bottle or stick in our eye, right? It's just like poking right out. Everybody's looking like, wow, what's wrong with you, Marilyn? Nothing. Nothing's wrong. And I'm like, you know, pointing out Jill's speck of sin in hers, right? It's like, but I got to first take this out of my eye. So I can see clearly. And that's what he's saying to them. He's like, he's like, look at it. You're blind to your own problems. You're blind to your own sin. What are you doing? What are you doing? He talks about their idol worship just, just so blatantly and so, so plainly here. It, it just, it, he says he's exposing the spiritual adultery of his people. He says, you are white hot passionate for other gods, small g, small g, okay? You're worshiping them. You're worshiping. They're doing the rituals in the places that the Canaanite, the pagans, are worshiping their pagan gods. You're doing the same things. He says, among every green tree, among the smooth stones of the stream, and a high and lofty mountain, that's how they would worship their gods. And that's what, quote unquote, God's people were doing. Judah's leaders, okay? And so in this picture, the Lord, as we know, right, is the husband, right, is the husband of Israel. We talked about that a couple weeks ago. He's a husband. And, and he sees their passionate, their chronic attraction for idols was like the lust of an adulterer. And so what was happening is his people were pursuing false gods, right, like a lover runs after the focus of their love. Same kind of thing. And that's what they were doing. And he saw that. And he saw them yielding to those other lovers. He saw them yielding to them. He says, you have uncovered yourself to those other than to me, is what God said. Now, 
I call it like the whoredom, right? The whoredom of, of Judah here is absolutely compared to that of, his, of an adulteress who's been just so blatant, so open, so um, she doesn't commit her sins anymore in secret. It's all public. They just, he, she just does it openly, all the time, okay? Shamelessly, brazenly, okay? And so she acts without restraint. She doesn't blush anymore. And that's what God's comparing these leaders of Judah to. This is who you are. This is who you are. Under every green tree. Now, that refers to spiritual adultery because um, the pagan gods that the Israelites were really going after um, were, they, were, they did illicit sex rituals. And so the green tree is, in the pagan god worship is always talked about of constant fertility. Constant fertility. And so he says, look, not only are you doing that, but you're slaying children in the valley. Now, this is really hard to hear, but this is what they were doing. Uh, one of the Canaanites that the uh, Israelites, Canaanite gods that Israelites worshipped was Molech, was Molech. And he received children as sacrifices. And so Molech was worshipped by heating up a metal statue representing the God until it was red hot. And then by placing a living infant on its outstretched hands of the statue, while they would beat drums to drown out the screams of the child until it burned to death. That's what Judah's leaders were doing. See, Moloch was one of the lovers God's people forsook the Lord in their spiritual adultery. And you know, what came to mind is I thought, people who wouldn't even make a small sacrifice to the Lord, grain offerings, oil offerings, not even a small sacrifice to Yahweh God, the Lord God, they would kill their own children to a pagan idol. Deceived. Depraved mind. Now these sacrifices should have been to the Lord. They should have been to the Lord, okay? But his unfaithful people gave them to the idols instead. He also said that, look, behind all your doors and your doorposts, you've put the pagan idols' names. I told you in Deuteronomy 6, 4 through 9, that you know, my name's supposed to be inscribed there. My name's supposed to be on your doorposts. My name's supposed to be behind the doors, okay? And, and what you've done is, is there's a perverse twisting of that. Perverse twisting of it. And that's what Satan does, doesn't he? He takes what's true and just perver perverts it. Perverts it. And there's a perverse twisting of that. And now the pagan gods are on the doorposts and behind the doors. And he says, and now you're wearied. He says, but you're wearied. They told, oh, we're wearied in the length of our ways. Well, as time went on, the spiritual adultery of God's people, okay, it wasn't rewarding. Yet, like the initial thrill had worn off, had worn off, okay? And, and so they're wearied, okay? But even then, they wouldn't repent. It says, you did not say there is no hope. See, repentance is coming to the end of yourself and the end of your sin and saying, wow, I've had it all wrong. i got to give that over. Oh, Lord, forgive me. Oh, this is, right, there's no hope other than in, in Jesus, other than in Yahweh God. And he said, even through all of this, you said, no, yet there's no hope. There is no repentance, none at all. So God now describes his dealing with his disobedient people in verses 11 through 13. And basically, it's the end of God's patience with his people. You know how he says he's long-suffering? Well, at one point, he's not long-suffering, right? <laughs> at one point, it's like he's, he's describing the end of the patience with his people. And he says... 
And of whom have you been afraid or feared that you have lied and not remembered me? So the Lord is confronting the fact that his people do not fear him. Reverential awe. Reverential awe. That you are God and that I'm not. Okay? And, and so what you do is you actually fear someone or you fear something else. You don't fear me. Okay? And so he says you haven't taken it to heart, to your heart. And so they have a very low view of God very, very low view of God, and they have a lack of respect for him. And he goes on to say, is it not because I've held my peace from of old that you do not fear me? In other words, it's his mercy. It's his mercy. You're not getting what you deserve because I'm merciful. You're not getting what I deserve because I'm merciful. And so why did God's people lack respect for him? Because he showed mercy because he showed mercy, and he didn't punish their sins immediately. So they could just go on their own merry way. They thought, hey, you know what? He doesn't see this. This is really good. Nobody will know. Right? See, repentance isn't when, okay, let's say your child has been doing whatever, okay, and then they get caught at it, all right? It's great for them, you know, to then repent at that time, all right? But repentance is a heart that comes and says, you know what, Mom? I've been doing this, this, this. Please forgive me. You, you recognize your sin, you recognize what you have done, and you fall on your face. Okay, getting, you know, not getting caught is what they're doing. They just thought, oh, well, we'll be fine, we'll be fine, we'll be fine, we'll be fine, we're good, we're good. And God was long-suffering, God was merciful, right? He just, okay, okay, I love you, I love this, this, and then... There's a come up and stay because he loves you, because he wants you to turn, because life isn't about today. It's about forever, and he wants you to be with him. He wants to have a relationship with you, and he's like, turn. You need to turn. You need to turn. You need to repent. Whatever it takes, I love you. Whatever it takes, I love you. And so he didn't punish their sin immediately, and they thought they were getting away with it. So they just kept doing it over and over again. They made a crucial, crucial error here. Crucial error, common to fallen humanity, quite frankly. They mistook God's mercy, God's mercy and forbearance for weakness and lack of resolve. Right, they looked at God as, oh, well, lack of resolve with him and weak and this, this thing. No, no meanwhile, it's his forbearance and his mercy because he loves them, because he loves you and me. And see, God's people didn't trust in him. And the things they did, they were trusting in themselves. They were trusting in themselves, or they were trusting in their idols. So God calls them on the carpet again and says, okay, well, uh, let your collection of idols deliver you then. Remember before? I was like, okay, here's your idol. Okay, it's made out of wood. It's the same wood that you're using to make your fire over here. It turns to ashes to make your dinner, right? And meanwhile, you're worshiping that. Does that make sense? And remember, it's like you can't even build it so it like stands up. It like totters over, remember? And he's like, hey, bring them. Bring them to my court. Have them, you know, have them declare who they are and defend you. I don't hear you, right? I love how God's like, okay, so now he's doing it again. So he says, okay, look, um, um, okay, so let the idols deliver you then. If you guys think you're such hot shots and you don't know my mercy and this, this, how much I love you, then let your idols de deliver you. Oh, by the way, they can't help you. They can't help you. Um, your idols are so weak and helpless that a breath will take them away. A breath will take them away. But he who puts my trust excuse me, he who puts his trust in me shall possess the land and shall inherit my holy mountain. Is that so great? Okay, here's, okay, here's what you don't want to do. But here's life. Just like he says, I set before you, what? Choice. Here's death, here's life. Choose life. Choose life. He's saying the same thing here over and over again. He who puts his trust in me shall possess the land and shall inherit my holy mountain. Huge contrast to those who turned away from God. Trust in the Lord makes a person secure. Trust in the Lord makes a person secure. You're not secure in yourself, and you're not secure in your idols. 
but you're secure in him. You're secure in him. Trust in me. Put your trust in me. You're going to possess the land, right? It's going to be right. It's going to be absolutely, you know, all about me down here. And oh, by the way, you're going to inherit my holy mountain. It's going to be all about me when you see me there. It's a win-win. It's a win-win situation. So let's read 14 to the end. Because now he's talking about um, a stumbling block um, that will be removed and how it will be removed. And it will be said, build up, build up, prepare the road. Remove the obstacles out of the way of my people. For this is what the high and lofty one says, he who lives forever, whose name is holy. I live in a high and holy place, but also with him who is contrite and lowly in spirit. To revive the spirit of the lowly and to revive the heart of the contrite. I will not accuse forever, nor will I always be angry. For then the spirit of man would grow faint before me, the breath of man that I have created. I was enraged by his sinful greed. I punished him and hid my face in anger, yet he kept on in his willful ways. I have seen his ways, but I will heal him. I will guide him and restore comfort to him, creating praise on the lips of the mourners in Israel. Peace, peace to those far and near, says the Lord, and I will heal them. But the wicked are like the tossing sea, which cannot rest, whose waves cast up mire and mud. There is no peace, says my God for the wicked. Okay, so you see him saying, build it up, build it up. Do you remember the highway of holiness? Do you remember that? We're on the highway of holiness. Well, we studied that, okay. And so what he's saying here, here is he's using the same imagery as he did in Isaiah 35, where it's the highway of holiness. And he's describing that highway for God's people. It's a raised up highway, right, that we're on right now, that we're on right now, okay? And what happens is, is this raised up highway is above all obstacles. Because who's taking him out of the way? God does. Remember, he says, those are my mountains. Those are all my mountains. And that mountain's going to be your blessing, because I'm going to take you right through that mountain, right? There, he, he already gets rid of all the obstacles. He gets rid of them, okay? And so, and so he says, look, build it up, build it up, build up the road so that God's people can return to me without obstacle. So in other words, he takes away all the obstacles because he's like, repent. There's no obstacles in the way. Come back to me. Come back to me. Come back to me. Okay. And so whatever gets in the way of us getting right with God, okay, must be taken out of the way. Whatever gets in the way of us getting right with God must be taken out of the way. Now I'm not just talking salvation. I'm not just talking coming to Jesus, what personally, I mean, passionately, to powerfully, to preeminently, that he rules over you, he rules over your thoughts, your decisions, your family, your finances, your kids, you know, your ministry, your job. He rules over, okay? In other words, it's, it's us being saved. We're saved, we're being saved, and then there'll be the ultimate salvation one day, okay? And so it's continual, it's continual, right? It's that raised road, and God's people we can return to him without obstacle. And whatever gets in the way of us getting right with him, right? Getting right with him must be taken out of the way. It's a good, good thing. Now, he talks to his, his uh, wayward um, leaders of Judah, and he says, look it, um, I'm going to deal with those obstacles. And so in verses 15 through 21, he describes the way of restoration. He describes the way of peace, okay? And so he says, look, to be right with me, you first have to understand my great majesty. You first have to understand my great majesty. I, I am so other. I'm not like a superhuman guy, okay? I have great majesty. He says, for thus says the high and lofty one who inhabits eternity, whose name is holy. I'm other. I'm God, you're not, okay? And, and the Lord introduces his, his, um, himself to his people with titles reflecting his great majesty. His, he expects his people to respond to him as the glorious God that he is. He's not, not, he's not just another small G God. He's not a little idol that you made with your hands. He is Yahweh God. I am. And he says, I live in a high and lofty place, but at the same time, I will live with you, with the contrite and humble in heart. 
I will live with you, right? This is the second thing to being right with him, right? That you're contrite, that you're humble in heart to him. Okay, before the great God of majesty. When you see the great God of majesty, all you can do is fall on your face. All you can do is fall on your face. I mean, no wonder you're humble. No wonder you're contrite in heart. And he's like, oh yeah, I will live with you. I will live with you. That's so great. I will live with you. You're so great. He says, and I'm not going to contend with you forever and be angry. I'm not going to do that. So the third thing in getting right with him is, is you know his great love. You know his great love over and over again. The Lord shows his great mercy, not getting what we deserve over and over and over again to us. Okay. But promises what? He says, look at, I will relent and I'm not going to be angry forever. I will relent and I won't be angry forever. Okay. And so though God disciplined his people, he now says what? I have seen his ways and will heal him. I will also lead him and restore comforts to him. Isn't that so great? Isn't that so great? Isn't it just like when you're like sharing with your kids and they're little and this, this, and they would do something wrong and everything, and you're like, come here and sit in my lap. I just want to hold you. I just want to tell you how much I love you. I just want to restore our relationship. I just want to make sure that you know that just because what you've done doesn't mean I don't love you. Right? That's so sweet. And that's what he's doing over and over and over again. And he says, look, peace, peace to those far away and those are near. And so he's talking about, hey, peace is for everyone who accepts me. That means Gentiles and Jews. Near and far away. It's for everyone, okay? So each, of, each person can receive my shalom, can re which is more than the absence of hostility. You know that, right? It's a peace that passes all understanding. So where you're walking through the fire, you don't even smell like smoke, right? Right? You just walk through it in the peace that passes all understanding, right? It's a gift of precious, precious well-being. It is well with my soul. Wow, there's a huge eddy curtain in my life zooming around me all the time, but it is well with my soul. It is well with my soul. Paul speaks of that, right? Um, and he says about Jesus fulfilling this promise exactly, and he says... Uh, in Ephesians 2, 17, and he came and preached peace to you who were afar off and to those who were near, both the Jews and the Gentiles, okay? And so it was revealed through Paul that those who were far off were Gentiles and those who were near well, was the Jewish population. So both can come to peace by receiving God's gift through Jesus Christ, through Jesus Christ, okay? But he ends with what? The wicked are like the sea. The wicked are like the sea. Okay, the troubled sea. It cannot rest, okay? There's no peace for the wicked. So in contrast to those who return to God, for those who repent, for those who are walking uprightly, okay, um, wicked are still without peace. They will have no peace, okay? So God's, here's what happens. God's great mercy is to everyone. It's held out to everyone. God's great mercy is held out to everyone. But it must be received. Whether you're a Jew or Gentile, it must be received. Here, I'm giving my all to you, but you have to receive the gift. You have to receive that. Okay? Um, I, uh, I, I love how it mentions the sea at the end here. And I, I went and I looked, uh, read about the sea in, in the Word. And, um, you know, the Israelites thought that the sea was a dangerous and dark place. A dangerous and dark place. It was a restless place in the mind of the ancient Jews. Okay? And so when I was reading Revelation 21.1, it says, you know, there'll, there'll be a new heaven and new earth and no more sea. And I thought, I, I bet that's why. I bet that's why because it was looked at as such a dark, dark, dangerous place restless place in the mind of the ancient Jews. And when he says, but the wicked are like the troubled sea when it cannot rest. But meanwhile, in the new heaven and earth, there's no wicked. There's no sea. I read that to Tori. I said, Tori, you have a job. No more Navy. <laughs> what? I said, well, let's go through this story. I said, Supposed to be a little joke, Terry. <laughs> so, so I mean, how sweet is that, right? That I mean, that that look. If you walk this way, then this is what happens. If you walk this way, 
then this is what happens. Choose life. Choose life. Don't choose death. Choose life. And it's in me. It's in me. And what did they do? They continued to choose their own way. So I'm going to ask you, I'm going to ask you right now, in closing, I'm going to ask you, what are your idols? What are your idols? What are your idols? Do you have any idols? Do you have anything that you put before God? Did you used to have idols? Okay, um, maybe I used to have idols of, I know I used to have idols of my image. I used to have idols of my kids. I remember when my mom uh, shared years ago, 2002, JJ actually uh, uh, videoed this. It was um, our testimony together at Elmbrook for Mother's Day. Coming up. And um, mom said, I had made Margo my idol. I came along 11 years later um, than my sisters, 12, 11 and 12 years later than my sisters, and um, she had made me her idol. And uh, she said, you know, I needed to just lay you down. So I laid you at the feet of Jesus, and then he could work on me. And um, I see, uh, not anymore, praise God, but I used to see my kids being my idols because I wanted them for so long. I went through infertility. I went through, you know, um, our last one was stillborn at five months along, and, and, um, and then God miraculously gave us children through adoption. And they became my idols. Like what God gave me instead of him. And then he said, no, you got to lay that down. you got to lay those girls down. They're only on loan to you, and I'm your God. I'm like, yeah, I know that, but, you know, i got to take care of them. No, I've got this. I'm your God. You give them to me. And so don't just look at the Israelites and think, oh, that's just terrible. I would never do that. Right? I would never do that or sacrifice or, you know, whatever. You guys, <laughs> it's so easy, once again, to look at somebody else and go, oh, I, oh, and then I'm okay, right? And then meanwhile, the Lord's got, you got the speck in your eye, and the Lord's like, oh, I want that speck out. I want that speck. You're not seeing clearly, Margo. You need to have that speck out. You're not seeing clearly. So I want you to think, and write down what your idols used to be or maybe what you're still struggling with. Because anything that you put before him is an idol. And in fact, a lot of us, it's very easy to start worshiping the created instead of the creator. Like, you know, everything he's giving us, or, you know, that, that type of thing, right? Where it's just like, you know, you're thanking him for all this, 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 this. And yes, you thank him for your daily bread. And yes, absolutely. But what we do is, is then when, when something doesn't happen like we think it should, then it's like, oh, oh. And meanwhile, then you know that you're not just grateful for him and, bl and blessing him. You're actually in love with what he creates for you. So you're more in love with the created than the creator. Like I used to wake up in the morning and say, okay, God, here's my day. Here's my day. Like he didn't know. Like, you know, here's my day. And I'd be like, so, okay, you see, so bless this. Okay, bless this, you know, and yeah, bless this. And I, I, for years I did that. For years I did that. And he just so slayed me so sweetly. It's like, Marco, no, 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 see, it's my day. It's my day. You're living on borrowed time here. It's my day. And I want you to do what I bless. And so all the interruptions of the day, all this, these are divine. They're right from my hand. Don't tell me this is your day. Whole big change. Whole big change of heart, change of mind. Once again, time was my idol. My time. You're interrupting my time. It's like, oh no. You're living on borrowed time as it is. This is my time. 
I want you to live according to what I have for you. So I want you to write that down. Um, does anyone, with just a couple minutes that we have left to share, does anyone want to share at all what um, they used to have? Because I'm very used to sharing all oh, my yuck. <laughs> um, is, isn't it, you know, and it's usually how, you know, it's our bent. It, you know, it's our bent. And how, how then insidiously, right, the, the accuser comes along and says, oh, no, you got to be doing this, you got to be, right? And, and it's, your, it's usually your bent of your personality, you know, with that. And then he perverts it, right? And then it becomes your idol. That's good. Thanks for sharing.